message, and the message is about almost and all together. It's about almost living for Christ and all together living for Christ. And we're going to look at Paul, and I'm going to try and keep it from being a character study, but he's given a bit of his testimony, so that's what it's going to be. Brother Jesse, you want to, Jesse, knock the gal, you want to open us up in prayer? Amen. So I just want to read real quick. I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but we're going to pick up in verse 24. So 26, 24 in the book of Acts. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day, both were almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. So where we're picking up here in the book of Acts, just for a little bit of background, a little bit of context so you understand the story, is Paul has been in prison on his way to go give his testimony and his story before Rome. He, he's been in this long journey. It's been a couple years now, and he's given his testimony multiple times. It went before the Sanhedrins, and he appealed to Caesar. So now his case has got to go all the way up to the Roman government. And Paul's case has been very slow moving up to this point. Festus, who we just read about and the text has now been given charge over the case of Paul. And after a few years, King Agrippa, one of his friends stops in, and he asks King Agrippa, will you sit in on this man, and will you listen to his case? He, want, he wants to get his opinion on what he has to say about Paul. So in this whole chapter, Paul gives his testimony and his case for Christ. If I've ever seen a case for Christ, it's right here in this chapter, and it's the story of Paul. There's no, there's no greater Christian to ever have lived than Paul himself. He was the one where we get most of the books of the Bible and most of the stories of the Bible and most of the things that we know, our doctrine, our church doctrine. Paul established that. And starting down here in verse 1, Paul begins, I say, And then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. And then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof. I am accused of the Jews. So here it goes. Paul's giving his testimony. Paul's about to preach and let King Agrippa know why he has appealed to Caesar, why he is being persecuted by the Jews. In this instance, and we see Paul is taught from his youth. Paul begins at the very beginning of his life. My brother one time had this little journal, this little diary he decided to start. My sister probably already knows what I'm going to talk about. And we snuck into his room and we grabbed it. And he had one thing written at the front of it, and it said, it all started when I was born. <laughs> that was it. He never, he never wrote anything else in it. That was the end. And that's where we're starting right here with Paul. Is right there at the beginning. We see from verse 4, from my youth. Paul's going all the way back to the beginning. And he says, my manner of life from my youth, in verse 4, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. So Paul grew up a Jew his entire life. And being a Jew in the Roman Empire and in the New Testament times was a pretty big deal when you were committed as Paul was. We see him go on to be a Pharisee. And the things about being a Jew is three major things. is learning and memorizing vast parts of the Torah. A lot of 
the Jews that went on and got chosen by a rabbi to become a Pharisee and sit under someone had to memorize almost all the Old Testament. We see they had strict adherence to the law and all atonements and feast participation. They were active in their faith. Not only did they have to memorize it, but they had to live it out. Right? And the third thing is well studied and taught in the Hebrew tongue to read and write. Not a lot of people, I tried researching it, it's really spotty to find answers from the Roman Empire, but they say about 15% of people, if that, could read or write in the Roman Empire. And it was a big deal to read and write. We take it for granted now, but it was a big deal back then. Most people could just read what the change was, what the money was, what the prices were, and the trade language. That was about all they had down. But here the Jews would learn how to read and write because of the scriptures, because that's how God communicated his word to them. Right? And we see Paul continue to say, and something that I really want you to notice in verse 5 is he says, Most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Because that's where Paul came from. Paul came from religion. Paul wasn't a Gentile. He was a saved Jew underneath the law. Right? And over in, uh, I'm going to have you guys turn over there to Philippians 3, verses 4 through 7, we can get a picture of what this looked like for Paul, what his life was. He kind of, in this chapter, gets on talking about himself a little bit, and knowing Paul, he doesn't do that much. He's very meek, he's very humble, but Paul starts to give a little bit of his credentials so this church can understand who he is. So Philippians 3, and we're going to start in verse 4. Sorry, I should have bookmarked it. Verse 4, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what did he say at the end of all that? But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. You can flip on back over to Acts 26. So what Paul goes on here talking about is how he was such a participant in his religion, right? The straightest sect of our religion. He says, ask anyone that knows me and they will testify the exact same thing that I lived to Pharisee. Right? Some of you, if I went to where you worked and asked that person that you worked with what you're like at work, do you think it's going to be the same as it is in here? I really hope it is. Now, if I go and ask some of your family members, is it going to look the same as it is in here? Well, Paul says, do it. Fact check me. Anybody that I know that I grew up with my entire life, ask them. That's pretty faithful. I can't say it the same for me. I know where I've slipped and fallen short, and I can't say that I live a blameless life. But Paul, Paul was a pretty good guy at this point, right? But what does he say? None of that matters. It's all vain. Who cares if you're the best baseball player in the world if you die? You ain't playing baseball no more, are you? No, sir. And so Paul was doing it right. He was living for God. But there was something greater. And we're going to see that when we come in the text. But when we get down to verse 6, right after all this, Paul says, And now I stand and am judged. He's talking about why he's here. For the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. So the promise that... Paul's talking about here is the national resurrection of Israel, and that's something that the Jews were familiar with. That's something that the uh, scriptures testified of in the Old Testament, right? That Israel would be resurrected. That's something that they looked forward to. That's their hope, right? That's where their hope was planted. And Paul uses this, and he twists it in a little bit of a way to get into King Agrippa's mind a little bit and say, hey, man, you're a faithful man. You're well taught in the Jewish law, right? You know all about our religion. You know what the scriptures testify of. And he asked in verse 8, Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? So before Paul gets to his testimony, he's just given a brief rundown of what he's here for before King Agrippa, right? He starts, I grew up, blah, 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 and now I'm here. So I grew up, and I'm here now, and I'm preaching to you about someone raising from the dead, something that's prophesied in the Old Testament, something that you're familiar with, King Agrippa. So Paul continues to give his testimony, and we see verses 9 through 18. In Acts 9, there's a more in-depth, full account of this same testimony. But this is Paul preaching it and letting King Agrippa know how he was saved and how he came to faith. And he says in verse 9, He did many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, 
right? So Paul was against the church. Not only was he a Jew, right, and zealous for the Lord, but he was actively against the Christian church. Jesus Christ had died. People had began to get into the body of Jesus Christ, the early church. This is right after Jesus died. And Paul was trying to be a responsible Jew and take care of these blasphemers. Because if Jesus Christ didn't die and raise again, this is blasphemy. These people becoming Christians is blasphemy. So what did Paul do? He did things contrary to to the name of Jesus Christ. He went actively against the church. And we see in verse 10 some of the things that he did. Verse 10, he shut them up in prison. Verse 10, he consented when they were put to death. Over in Acts 7, one of the first Christians is killed. Stephen stoned before the Sanhedrin. And in Acts 8.1, it says that Saul was there consenting unto his death. Saul was there from the beginning. He wasn't at the end of the sword. He wasn't at the end of the stone, but he was there ordering it. He was there making it happen. And not only that, but we see down in verse 11, punished them oft, compelled them to blaspheme. Compelling them to blaspheme is compelling them to denounce Christ. This still goes on in Muslim countries and third world countries and Africa and Japan and all of these small countries all across the world. There's Christians who are taken over by Muslims, by all sorts of different religion, communism. And what do they do to them? They compel them to blaspheme. I remember when ISIS was real big all over the news. I watched one of the most gruesome videos I've ever seen in my life. And it was 30 Muslims. Well, not Muslims, but they were in a Muslim country. And they became Christians. And they were all on their knees with ski masks over them. And ISIS would go up and say, denounce Jesus Christ or we'll kill you. And they killed every single one of them. All 30 of them. I'm not going to tell you how they died. It's a, little, it's a little disgusting, but I watched it. The entire thing. And that's what Paul was doing. Compelling them to blaspheme. Blaspheme is to denounce Christ. That's what their faith is in, right? That would be the same as us saying, no, I don't believe in Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul's going around doing. He goes so as far to say in verse 11... He's followed them to strange cities to persecute them. So it wasn't just a convenience thing. Paul was on the road. He had a mission. He had an objective. And it was to get rid of all of these pests to Judaism. All these pests to the faith. So this is where we pick up Paul's real testimony. And over in 1 Timothy, actually you guys can turn over there, 1 Timothy 1, verses 15 to 16. Actually, start up in verse 12. <clears throat> I believe it's verse 12. <clears throat> and Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, which was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. For this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. So this is a great passage for us devotionally to take and say, yes, I'm, I'm the chief of sinners, I'm the worst sinner, because we recognize that as Christians. I saw a post the other day from one of my family members, and I'm not going to use the words this post used. They're not appropriate in church, and I don't think they're appropriate at home. And it blasphemes God, then it blasphemes the devil, then it blasphemes Jesus, and then it says they're all a lie, and I'm responsible for my decisions and I don't hide behind the devil and blame him for my decisions. I don't know what kind of backwards junk that is, but we don't do that, do we? Right? The devil's not responsible for my actions. I am. I take personal accountability. That's how you get saved. If you don't do that, you ain't getting saved. Right? If you're not a sinner, how can you, why do you need to get saved? Right? If you ain't got cancer, why do you need the cure? And I came from a church where the cure is all they gave. They never gave you the diagnosis. <laughs> they never told you, hey, man, you're going to hell. That's where you're heading. 
But they want to tell you, Jesus wants you. Jesus loves you. Come on home. Come home. It ain't home for you yet. Is it? When you get saved, it's your home. Come on back. Back? How about get there? How about you get down on your knees and take some personal responsibility? Right? And what does Paul say? He doesn't hesitate to take personal responsibility. Of sinners whom I am chief. He's putting himself at the front of the pack. But what does he say in the next verse? How be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long sufferings, the pattern to them here which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So despite him being the chief of sinners, what does God do with him? He saves him. And he makes him a pattern to them which should hereafter believe. That's what we're doing right now. Paul is our pattern. We're reading 2,000 years later. We're reading the pattern of Paul's life and trying to apply it to our own, trying to take something from it, and trying to put ourselves in his shoes, put ourselves as the chief of sinners, and realize that we obtained mercy and that we're a pattern to them which should hereafter believe. Like I said, doctrinally it's Paul, but it's a great devotional passage. And that's, I don't want to get away from the text here, but that completely pertains to where Paul's coming from. I'm chief. Not only was I not a Christian, you're, you're a sinner when you're separated from God no matter what. I don't care if you cheated or you lied. The, you, bo you broke the law both ways. Right? One little white lie, you still broke the law. Paul went beyond that. Paul had people killed for following Jesus Christ. But he humbled himself enough to say, yes, I was a sinner. Now he's standing before King Agrippa and a council of Jews and Festus and all the people in this courtroom, and he's given his case, and he's speaking it boldly, and there's no one around him, and he's been in prison for years, and he says over there, and Timothy, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all hath forsaken me. He was alone. I mean, some people get scared staying home alone for a day. Paul was alone in cellars. By himself. No one else around. There's him and God. For what? For the same thing that he was against. Now when we get down here, we get to actually see in verse 13 and going on, we get to see where Paul gets saved. This is the testimony of Paul and how he came to faith, right? How did a guy that was that far removed, that far away, Get saved. And I want you to take note of something in verse 13. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me, and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. We know that Paul right away said, what will thou have me do, right? That was one of his first reactions. What will thou have me do? He was ready to get right. Accountability. He didn't hide away. He was ready to get right. Something that I want you to notice is in verse 13, what does he say about God showing up to him? He says it's above the brightness of the sun. On the road to Damascus, he says the same thing. A light from heaven, just like the sun. Right? The scripture testifies of who the son's talking about, who the son's a picture of. Jesus is known and prophesied about in the Old Testament before he ever came and was born of the virgin as the son of righteousness. Right? And John, John says, in him was life, and this life was the light of men. And Jesus says of himself when he's preaching over there in John 9, 5, I am the light of the world. He says it time and time again. I don't even have enough time to talk about how much he talks about being the light, right? And we know, we know a great picture of the Trinity is the Son. We, we can't define the Trinity, but the Son's a great picture of it, right? So the Son has three different parts to it. It has the chemical reaction that keeps the Sun alive. It has the heat waves that you feel. And it has the light that you see. Those are the three elements of the Sun, right? The heat waves you feel is the Holy Spirit. The chemical reaction is God, and what is the light? Jesus Christ, right? 
Jesus Christ is the light. He's the manifestation of God. He's what you can see with your eyes when he was here. Paul immediately follows the light he's given. What will thou have me do? What was the purpose for getting Paul? Well, Jesus tells him clearly. He didn't hesitate to tell him. Paul said, what will thou have me do? And when you're ready for the call to action, you know what God's going to do? He's going to point you in the direction. He's going to send you on your way. Paul's purpose for getting called in verse 16, to make thee a minister and a witness. In verse 16, to things which thou hast seen. That's his personal testimony. That's what we're reading right now. But then what does it say? Things in which I will appear. That's the revelation of the church. That's the doctrine that we have now. That's the mysteries that Paul learns about and writes to us about. And to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. That's what it says over there in Acts 9 when Paul gets called. That's, that's why he's called. That's why God called him. To bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Who's Paul before? Right now. King Agrippa. Right? Prophecy right there. That's how the Bible works. Purpose for preaching. So why was Paul preaching? We see the purpose is clearly laid out in the text in verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So Paul, God called him for a reason, right? God called Paul and he told him exactly what he's calling him to and exactly what he's calling him for. Now what was Paul? He was totally transparent. Paul didn't hesitate to say all these things before King Agrippa. People think that when they come to church, they're going to get brainwashed or some guy is going to be real sly and try and trick them or something. It ain't a trick. I mean, people think that. You get saved. I remember when I got saved, it was like, oh, well, he's brainwashed. He got duped. He got tricked. Where does that come from? <laughs> Paul's totally, he's telling King Agrippa every single thing that's happened to him, what his purpose is, what God called him for, and why he's here preaching before King Agrippa, right? No hesitation. And what does he say to King Agrippa in verse 19? Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. So Paul said over there in Acts 20, he, shun, he didn't shun to declare the whole counsel of God, and that's what he's doing right here. He's telling King Agrippa what happened to him his entire life, everything he's here for. And what is, what is going on in this passage is Paul's trying to get something across to King Agrippa. Now, is he trying to win him to Christ? Yes. But he's also just doing what he's ordered to do by Festus at this point, which is give his testimony. He's ordered to do that by Jesus Christ as well. Give your testimony. And so he's following through, and obviously he wants to see King Agrippa won for Christ. And so he's being clear. Nothing is better than when someone is black and white with you and someone tells you the truth. There's no better feeling than that. When someone tells you up front, you don't want to go to the doctors and hear, man, it's, it's bad news. It's bad news. And then you're like, what? What? And they won't tell you. They keep beating around the bush. You, you want the doctor that's going to tell you, hey, man, this is what you need. This is your treatment plan. This is what we can do. This is your options. Our hands are tied. We don't know these things. We don't know much about this. There's a new medication. There's a new this. You want the one who's going to be transparent with you. And Paul's telling him the same thing that you would do. He's like, dude, if you saw the same thing that I saw, you wouldn't be disobedient. I was not disobedient. If you fell off, they say he fell off the horse. It doesn't say that in the scripture. But he fell to the ground, right? Paul's on the road to Damascus to persecute more Christians with orders from the high priest. And he's going along with the guards. And he's walking and the light shows up and he falls to the ground and he's blind for three days. And God tells him to go to a man named Ananias. And Ananias is going to give you your vision back. God shows up to Ananias and tells him, hey, Go to Saul of Tarsus, and you're going to give him his vision. He's blind right now. He's in prayer. Go to him, and you're going to help him. He's like, oh, the guy that's killing all of us? You want me to go to him? And he does it. And what does he say? Brother Saul. That's the first thing he says to him. Brother Saul. He calls him brother. And he goes and he heals him. You wouldn't be disobedient to God if that same thing happened to you. I hope not. 
But these things have happened to people. And they chose not to say, what will thou have me do? Or they chose not to get up and go see Ananias. They chose to sit there on the ground and weep and moan and cry and wallow in their sorrow and complain about it. God's trying to do something with you, but you got to move, right? And you got to be obedient. God desires obedience from us. And we see Paul follows through and he's obedient to the call. And there's clear that what he's preaching and what he's saying is not against the law. Because that's what they're after him for, is that Jesus Christ is against Judaism. Jesus Christ is against the faith that they have in God. So what does Paul say? Well, look down in verse 22. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. That Christ should suffer, that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and unto the Gentiles. What Paul's trying to get across to them is this book is true. Everything it says, all the Old Testament that you know, King Agrippa, does not contradict what I'm trying to tell you about Jesus Christ. And at this point, there's a shift from Paul's testimony to the scriptures. And it's clear, and I'm about to show it to you, and you're going to see it go down. Why is that? Because Paul's not saying, King Agrippa, believe me because of my testimony. Believe me because of what happened to me and what I went through. That doesn't always work with people. I try and tell people, Jesus Christ is good. He saved my soul. And I try and tell them my testimony, right? That's not going to do it, right? That's not enough for them. Right. Well, you saw something. Well, you, oh, you did this, you did this. That's not enough for some people. So what does Paul say is the key here? It's the scriptures, he said, go ahead. They, they're not in contradiction to what Jesus Christ said. The verse that came to mind when I first read that, saying none other things than those which should come, is the verse that talks about the mystery of godliness. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. It just named a list of things, and not a single one of those contradicts the Bible the Old Testament that they had. The mystery of godliness. That's the, that's the gospel right there. All the things that happen with Jesus Christ right there. And none of it contradicts. None of it goes against the Bible. And I want you to see an, another area where he brings up these words. So after he's talking, he's saying Christ should suffer. These things are in the Old Testament. These things are coming around. Where we pick up and where we read, Festus cut him off. And as he thus spake, so he's sitting here giving his testimony, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. In the middle of him talking, in the middle of giving, we, saw, we see someone get riled up. And if you've been saved any amount of time, you know what this is like. Because if, when you start throwing verses at people, and you start memorizing, you start witnessing a little bit, this is exactly what it looks like. Yeah. They, they start looking at you a little cockeyed, and they're wondering, like, this guy really lost it. I mean, when I got saved, it flipped the switch in me. I went from one guy to a new guy, a new man, right? And, I, I mean, it didn't happen overnight. I wasn't perfect. I'm still not, right? I'm being sanctified. I'm sanctified when it comes to my soul, right? But I'm still being sanctified right now. I'm still learning new things. But I, I switched pretty hard, and a lot of my friends can testify to that. A lot of my family can testify to that. They all were like, dude, what happened to you? You're nice. <laughs> we, can actually, we can talk to you. You're kind of cool. And that wasn't the case before. I was mean, right? And Paul was too. I didn't kill people, but I was pretty mean. I mean, I might have bullied my little brother and my little sister. That was about it, but, and some friends. But I, cha I changed, right? And people start looking at me the more Bible I get in me. I start singing hymns. Oh, my gosh. Hymns? Dude, you, you start singing those in a contemporary church. See how they look at you. I remember the first time I came in here, one of the first hymns I ever heard, this was 2020. Paul, Mike invited me to my, his church. I came alone. I had been to church now at a mega church just a few months, and that was my first church I ever went to in my life. I came in here, and I was like, dude, what did I just walk into? And the song that was playing... The song that was playing, I will never forget. It was He Abides. And it was talking about Pilgrim. I walked the Pilgrim way. 
I said, what about pilgrims? What does that have to do with anything? They talk about throwing me off. Much learning doth make thee mad. I'm like, you're singing about pilgrims, some little church building, red pews, a bunch of freaks. And now I'm here. I'm part of you. Don't get mad at me. But that was, that was my honest thoughts, totally transparent. I'm not shunning to give you the counsel of God. And what, is, what does Jesus say about the scriptures, right? What does he say about them himself? Well, he gives a command to the Pharisees. Search the scriptures. That's a command. Search the scriptures. Why? For in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. Right? So Jesus said, go ahead, check them out. Check me out. Check me. Do I match up? Am I right on all that? Is it lining up? Jesus says it himself. Paul says it. The Bible says it. And that's what he's trying to get across to King Agrippa here. In verse 24, when he says, doth make thee mad, I want you to notice how Paul responds. <clears throat> this is how a Christian is supposed to respond. Paul doesn't shut up and say, you're right, Festus, I take it all back. My whole life is a waste. Jesus Christ is not my Savior. No. He sticks with what he's saying. He's respectful. After he cut him off in the middle of talking and yelled at him. And he says, but he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. Look at the contrast in that. The unsaved man is screaming at him, cutting him off. You, you nut so. And what does Paul do? He treats him with respect. That's how we're supposed to treat people. Most of the time when I witness to people, there's, a, there's like a switch that flips about three-fourths of the way through if it's going really good. And it's like, yeah, oh, this is making sense. Conviction comes on their face. They start getting pale. Right? The Holy Spirit starts moving in. And they're like, man, this, stuff, this might be true. I might be going to hell. And then a switch flips about three-quarters of the way through, and they get mad. It's weird. It's the devil. And a switch flips, and they get mad, and they get loud. It happens a lot. They start yelling. They get loud, and they start yelling out of nowhere. It's not our job to yell louder than them, but we treat them with respect. We don't call them names. We treat them with respect. Most noble Festus. I mean, that's a great application right there. That's a whole sermon in and of itself right there. Your words with grace. Let your speech always be with grace. Right? Season with salt. Now, what I'm trying to say is Paul didn't switch up. He still stuck with what he was saying, but he was courteous and respectful with what he was saying. For the king knoweth of these things, in verse 26, <clears throat> before whom also I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. And I want you to notice the scriptures again. The words of truth, he was talking about the scriptures before, and look up, it comes at King Agrippa. Believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. He doesn't even give him time to answer. That's like asking the most common sense question in the world. Did you wake up today? Yeah, I know you woke up. You're talking to me. It's that quick. It's a no-brainer. He's taught in the law. He's taught in the religion. He knows that he believes the Bible, the Old Testament Bible at this point. <clears throat> So as Paul's talking to him in this verse, we see the whole chapter twist. And this is, this is where we're coming to. This is the most paramount part of the entire sermon Paul's giving, right? The response. What good is our witnessing without a response? And there's got to be something following. <clears throat> and the most important part here of what Paul's trying to get across to him and get across to us reading this now is that the scriptures are the greatest witness against us. It says over there, if you remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus, at the end of the story, the rich man's burning in hell, and he wants to go back and warn his brothers and his family about hell, the wrath to come. And he wants to tell them, get saved. Right? But what does Abraham say? He says, and he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, the Bible, the greatest witness against them, Neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Well, one rose from the dead. Right? And he says what? N neither will they be persuaded. Persuaded, though one rose from the dead. 
That's the first witness, is the scriptures. Don't just take what I'm saying. Don't just take my testimony. Don't just take what God's done to me, God, what God's done for me. Go check for yourself. I mean, that's your soul on the line. That's heaven or hell. That's the rest of eternity. That's the rest of time. And there's no redos or oopsies. That's it. <laughs> Once that time clock's punched, it's done. And so what happens here? We see the rest of eternity possibly be changed for King Agrippa. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost. It was an almost. But something weird, this one was real hard for me when I kept reading this and reading this and praying over it and reading it, is Paul's response to him. He says, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am except these bonds. I said, why would Paul want him to be almost? Wouldn't he want him to be altogether like him? Why would he say, I wish that you were almost and altogether? Why, why is it both? Why wouldn't he just say, I wish that you were all together like me except these bonds? And I kept praying because I just didn't get it. I mean, I read it again and again and again, and I was wondering, like, dude, what is going on with me? Why can't I understand this or wrap my head around this? Why would Paul say that? Every word of the Lord is pure. I didn't need to change it. I didn't need to look in something else. I just needed him to show me. Well, because it wasn't, it, it wasn't the end right here for King Agrippa. It doesn't say then he dropped down dead and went to hell for the rest of eternity. No, it says he almost was persuaded, and at the very end, he talks to Festus, and then they leave. And almost isn't finished yet until you're finished. And almost, at least you're almost there. I've had a couple buddies I witnessed to who were almost there. I got witnessed to a couple times, and I was almost there. I wasn't quite there, but I was almost there. Almost isn't done until you're done. And now what is Paul's greater hope for them? That they'll be all together such as him without these bonds. So what does that mean to be such as Paul without these bonds? Well, I want to contrast the two, an almost and an all together. Let's look at the almost Christian. So they believe the scriptures, King Agrippa, we see that in verse 27. They're taught in religion, verse 3. There's a lot of people that are atheists that know a lot about religion, right? But it doesn't say, almost thou persuadest me to be a Baptist. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Catholic. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Mormon. Paul's not preaching religion. Paul's preaching the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Paul wasn't going to church every Sunday. He was in prison. And Paul was preaching about getting saved, becoming a Christian, altogether such as me. And so there's two of the things that the almost Christian has, and the third one is power and worldly success. It's in his title, King Agrippa. It's hard to miss. Now I want to contrast that with the altogether Christian, Paul. So the altogether Christian is called by God for a purpose we see in verse 16. Paul was called clearly, and I already read through and told you what his purpose was, what he was called for. He speaks forth the words of truth. That's all we preach. When we speak, it's the oracles of God, right? We're trying to speak and preach the words of truth. We're about truth. We stand on truth. That's why it says Bible believers out there, because we believe it. I don't care if you think we're mad. We believe it, and it's truth, and that's what we stand on, and that's what we're all together for, because that's the words of God. And what's the last one? He's in bonds for faith, verse 29. He's not a Kenneth Copeland. He's not a Joel Osteen. He doesn't have $950 million in a private jet that used to be Tyler Perry's and some demon eyes. He's in bonds. He's arrested. He's in prison. Because that's the reality of an altogether Christian. That's the reality of some of our brothers and sisters overseas. They're getting killed and they're in prison just for preaching, just for believing in Jesus Christ. In communist countries all over the world, they try and kick out Jesus Christ. And people get persecuted for it. That's the reality of being an altogether Christian. But what does Paul wish? He wishes that you were all together without the bonds. He says, man, I wish you could be like me and you didn't even have to be in prison. It didn't even cost you as much as it cost me. I wish you could be like me and it didn't cost you as much as it cost me. Paul was willing to go to hell for the Jews. 
And I bet he was willing to take bonds so that none of us had to. He was willing to sit in prison the rest of his life so we could get saved. I know I'm coming down to the end here, and I just want to wrap up with a little quote that I heard from Martin Luther. I don't remember who said this quote recently, but I really, I really liked it. And it really resonated with this chapter here when it's talking about being an altogether Christian. And all these young preacher boys came to Martin Luther, and they're asking him, Mr. Luther, how do you, how do you get so many people to come while you're preaching? How do you have such big revival? Right? Because Martin Luther, if you don't know, he was a big part of the Protestant Reformation. The Reformed, right? They reformed from the Catholic Church. They left the Catholic Church. And they stood out on this book. That was the biggest factor, is this book. That it's not about religion. It's not about Catholicism. It's not about any of that. Paul wasn't preaching that. What was Paul preaching? This book. It said it verse, verse, verse. The words of truth. This is what Paul was holding forth. And that's what Martin Luther stepped out on is faith in the word of God and said, this is a religion. Catholic Church is not right. And it's not true. And it's not biblical. And it's not what Jesus Christ set up. Paul was not about religion and we are not about religion here. And so Martin Luther steps out in faith and he leaves the Catholic Church and there's a lot of cool sayings. I mean, we've heard so many of them. There's a lot of cool sayings he has, but they all come to him and they're like, how do you get such big crowds? How do you get so many people to come out? How do you get such revival? And he looks at them and he says, catch on fire and they'll watch you burn. That's, that's what it's about. Even though no one was around Paul, they were watching him burn. And it doesn't matter if you, you came from a religious background or much like me, you didn't. You didn't grow up. You didn't go to church Wednesday, Sunday. You, you never went never been around it, you didn't know the Bible, you never heard any of this stuff. It doesn't matter where you come from, it's not too late because you got a lot of witnesses against you and one of them is this book. And now that you've heard me preach out of this book, there's not a single person in here that has an excuse. Right? But the truth is in your lap and it's up to you to see if Jesus is who he says he is and if God says Jesus is who he is and if the Bible testifies that then what he did is true, right? Like Paul talks about, our faith is vain if he didn't die and rise, right? So it's your turn to check it out. It's your turn to get in this book. And if you are saved, it's the same thing, the same, the same source of power, this book right here. And it's our job to get in it. It's our job to get equipped in it. And if we suffer bonds, so be it. But we're going to be an altogether Christian, not an almost. I'm not going to get to the end of my life, say I, I almost finished my race, I almost ran my course. I'm almost ready to be offered up. No, what, what does Paul say to Timothy? He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. No almost in there. So, Aaron, you want to pray us out? I'm done for today.